and he hits the bullseye in that tweet like he often does. Um, we can't be chasing the perfect all the time. I mean, sometimes you have to take the good and put it in your pocket and take the win. He wants to make sure that people don't get left behind. He wants to make sure that there's competition in the marketplace so that rates are lower and people can choose their doctor. So if those three things are incompatible with some members of the uh, Republican House, then, then it's going to be incompatible and then we need to work with moderate Democrats to make sure that that happens. I think it's more or less a warning shot that we are willing to talk to anyone. We always have been. Um, just for the record, I think a lot of the tweets have been disastrous and some of the many have been false. So I, I think when you start something out with like in, in full suck up mode, saying that he hits the bullseye with his tweets as he often does, is a problem because then it's hard to believe the rest of what you're saying. Um, well, no, he's just being such an enabler right there, and it's There's kind of the crux of the problem right the now with this White The group around the president House. has got There's to stop that. The full lollipop. The full <laughs> <laughs> Joining us now, member of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Republican Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. He is a founding member of the House Freedom Caucus and served as its first chairman. Welcome back to the show, sir. Um, it's good to be with you. Let's look ahead first before we look back. How does tax reform look given everything that you've witnessed in the past week? Well, I mean, I think we've got a lot of things we have to get done. Um, I think the mistake on this past bill was we didn't do what the American people sent us here to do because it wasn't full repeal. So when it comes to tax reform, when it comes to border security, when it comes to the other big issues we've talked about accomplishing and that we promised the voters we would, let's just do what we said. If we do that, I think we'll be fine. If we don't, I think we may have the same problems we had on this last bill, unfortunately. Um, were you, um, was the White House um, very forceful in its hope that you all would support the bill? Or how would you describe we, how the White House worked good with you? Conver yeah, good conversations. We know a number of the people, Dr. Price, Mick Mulvaney, folks we used to serve with, uh, Vice President Pence, the president was, was, was good as well. Um, but in the end, it was about the legislation. Right. Remember, the lesson here is don't try to pass a bill that only 17% of the country approves of. That's a problem. You right. know, the, uh, 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 the, uh, Mr. Priebus was talking about don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Well, this wasn't even good. When no one likes the legislation, you have to do it different. That's and that's what we were saying. It wasn't going to bring down premiums. It had a host of problems. And frankly, the key promise we made the American people in the 2010, 2014, and 2016 election was we would repeal Obamacare. This legislation didn't do that. And that was the fundamental flaw in this entire process. So right. let's get back to work and let's do what we said we would do. Mark McKinnon. Congressman, uh, you, you all did an, an amazing job of holding together under a lot of pressure from the president and a lot of others. My question is, were you unanimous within the caucus about a bill that you all agreed on? Yes, yes. We had introduced uh, the, the clean repeal, the very thing we voted on 15 months ago. In fact, we thought that's where the process was going to start. Just a, six, seven weeks ago, we thought that was going to be the first thing we introduced was the very thing we all voted for that we put on President Obama's desk. And then we had a separate piece of legislation that was replacement legislation sponsored by Congressman Sanford on the House side and Senator Paul on the Senate side. That was our plan. That's the plan that's consistent with what we told the American people. That's what we thought we were going to do, or at least something like that. And instead, we get this mishmash of a bill that's hidden away, introduced three and a half weeks ago, no actual hearings where you have witnesses, no amendments allowed to be offered, binary choice, take it or leave it, that only 17 percent of the country likes. That's the problem. Steve uh, Congressman Ratner? Steve Ratner, uh, that, that may all well be, but I think there are a couple other factors to bear in mind. One, your bill would have required 60 votes in the Senate to pass, not 50 votes in the Senate, because it couldn't have been done under reconciliation. Not so the clean repeal. Not the first part. Co go ahead. It could not have been done that way, correct? Well, the clean repeal could have been done. The repeal of Obamacare could have been done. The same thing we passed 15 months ago and put on President Obama's desk. That could be done through reconciliation. But remember, the leadership's plan was a three-step process. It had three phases to it. So if they were going to be able to get phase two and phase three, why can't we get our second part, the part that's going to require a few Democrats to do the right thing in the Senate and pass it, why couldn't we have done that as well once we'd repeal it? In fact, because Democrats you might... Gonna, you, weren't, you weren't going to get the down. But look, the heart of the question, my heart of, the heart of my question is this, which is, so you failed. You ended up with Obamacare 1.0 still being the law of the land. 
why was not the bill that the House leadership and the President proposed, which would have made a number of changes, many changes in your direction, gotten to maybe Obama, call it Obama 2.0 if you want, why was that not better than 1.0, which is what you're stuck with now for the foreseeable future? First of all, just like I said before, Steve, 17 percent of the country didn't, didn't like it. It didn't repeal Obamacare. Even Krauthammer called it Obamacare light. Not me. He did. So, and he was actually for it. It didn't bring down premiums, which became the focus. We were willing to work and try to get there, even though it was a bad bill if we would at least bring down the premiums for middle class families. And CBO said premiums are going to continue to rise for the next three and a half and, years. And then, so they, were, and then the they were going to start to go down after the next three and a half years under this bill. Start to go down relative to the baseline, not start to go down in real dollars and significant dollars. So that was the problem when you have legislation that does, not to mention the new entitlement that is advanced refundable tax credits for people with no tax liability, not to mention the fact that we took Medicaid expansion and extended it for several years. A host to things that were so, in our clean so, repeal so just 15 months ago. Let's just go over here. What, what, why did the House leadership and why did Trump try to rewrite like the laws that cover one fifth yeah. of America's economy in 17 days? Yeah. Like that, Newt Gingrich didn't even try to do that. No, it's, it, and that's a fundamental question. It, it, again, there were political problems with this bill, there were policy problems, and there were process problems. And typically, good process will lead to better policy, so, which so I think did, leads what, to better what did politics. What they tell you, though, Jim? I just don't understand they, it. Like, they're, they're telling you know, conservative Republicans, we're going we're gonna to alter one-fifth of the economy in 17 days, and, oh, by the way, we're changing it while you sleep, and you're going to have to vote on a bill where we don't even give you a CBO score. Joe, you, you know what they told us because you saw it. They rolled it out after it was hidden away. When they rolled it out, they said it's a binary choice, take it or leave it. No, no, normally when you have hearings on a piece of legislation that impacts this much of our overall economy, you would bring in some witnesses and hear from some witnesses about what's going to happen if this legislation actually becomes law. We had none of that. We went straight to markup. No amendments could be offered in the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, the Budget Committee, and finally they took a manager's amendment at the last hour to try to get people to vote for it. Anybody that is a problem. Way, anybody threaten you guys? Because in the good old days, Gingrich's people would always threaten us and would laugh at them. Anybody threaten you? No, I mean, look, no, that, that didn't happen. No, 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 I mean, I mean, just so we can have a big laugh, because threats, as obviously some people in the White House don't understand, threats always backfire. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any room for that. Let, let's just do the right thing. I mean, I, I've said on, the, on your show before, we make this too complicated. Yeah. What did we tell the American people we would do? We said we would repeal it, then replace it. Let's do that. And why not yeah. start with the legislation we all voted for, they all voted for, and then just put that on <laughs> President Trump's desk. All right, it was, yeah, it was noted by our executive producer that was not a no, that you weren't threatened. <laughs> Congressman Jim <laughs> Jordan, oh, come on. on behalf of America, Thank you. We thank you. Very much. Uh, thank whether, you guys. whether you support the Freedom Caucus or don't support the Freedom Caucus, I think they did a great, great, great uh, thing for America. They did a great thing for America. Great thing for America. How a bill doesn't become law. How does it become law? I, by the you way, you know, all of us Democrats should become contributors to the Freedom you Caucus. You really should. We owe them a lot. You know, Mika, I don't like to do this very oh, often. Oh, no. You can talk about yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm going to talk about when I was in Congress. Oh. oh. About yourself Wait a minute. in you, Congress. Do you remember the Mark Sanford story? I Seriously, like that story. This is this. No, this is good. Is good. So this Mark is good. Sanford and I, we, we had killed a bill, and, and Gingrich's people called us in, and they were running around. They were screaming. We were all five of us sitting there. They were screaming. They said they were going to strip out all of the money for my military bases and everything else. And we're sitting there. They're screaming. And Mark Sanford just starts laughing at the most inappropriate moment. <laughs> and, like, everybody's staring at him like, your political career is being threatened. Why are you laughing? He's sitting there. And he turns to me and he goes, are they threatening me? Are they threatening us, Joe? I go, it sounds like it. He laughed. He goes, that's what I thought. He got up and he was just dying laughing and just walked right past the guys. And we all sort of filed in. Yeah. Threatening members never works. You know, I, we had a scene last night in the circus with Mark Sanford and he was so impressive. I mean, he was really thoughtful and he'd say, you know, and he had these whiteboards and position <laughs> papers. Yeah. And you could tell this was not just some political thing with the Freedom Caucus. Guys like Sanford were really serious and really deep in the policy. Yeah. Yep. I do. All right. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.